Hey guys, Toby Mathis here, and today we're going to talk about the differences between sole proprietorships, S-Corps, and C-Corps for running your business. And I'm just going to do a basic kind of contrasting between them all and the pros and cons, and I'll probably draw it out on, 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 a, on a whiteboard so that you guys can see it visually as well as, as understand it. So I'm going, to, I'm going to start kind of at the 10,000 foot view and hit a few things. Like number one, there's always going to be an issue about liability that we have to address. And people pretend like it doesn't exist. Sometimes they'll set up a business that they'll say, I'll just be a sole proprietorship. They'll file a DBA somewhere and they think that they have protection. Anything that goes wrong in that business is you. It's personal. So, you know, I used to use this example for people from the medical profession, doctors and stuff that had some high incomes and they would start investing and they'd go buy a little house. Maybe they'd buy a house in Indianapolis or Kansas City or one of these places where you can get an inexpensive house. Maybe they buy a $50,000 house and they say, what's the worst that could happen? I'll just get some insurance. And I'm like, the worst that could happen is that you have a wrongful death on that that exceeds your, 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 your coverage, which most likely will if it's a young person. And then they start garnishing you for the rest of your life until it's paid off with all the attorney's fees and all the costs. I actually had a individual come up to me during an event that I was teaching. Uh, this was a, I call a little old lady, right? But she was a gal that she was in her late seventies, early eighties. And it was kind of surprising to see somebody in that category at a real estate asset protection event. And I asked her what was going on. And she said, she had gone through the process and she lost 15 properties and her, and her, and she ended up going bankrupt. Let's put it, put a fine point on it because of a liability occurrence that was supposed to be covered by insurance and that her attorney said would never happen. Uh, and she ended up, uh, she called it dominoes is they foreclosed on one property, went to the next foreclosed on it. And by the time that you added in all the sheriff fees and all the legal costs and all that, there's almost no nothing when you force the sale. Now, what does this have to do with the business? Because the same principles apply. I open up a plumbing business and I accidentally flood out somebody's house. And uh, I actually own a home that had that happen. It was over $1.5 million worth of damage uh, because a pipe was not properly, they didn't put the glue and it came apart while the individuals were out of town. And so for uh, the better part of four days, water gushed into the house and destroyed the entire house. Well, who's liable for that? Well, you are, if, you, if you're the proprietor. And a lot of people just go out there, do it. They get minimum insurance because it's, um, they probably wouldn't qualify for higher deductibles. They're not, the insurance company's not gonna take on that risk and also money. Sometimes they don't even insure. They're like, oh, self-insure. So liability for that has to be addressed. And so I'm just gonna be real blunt with you guys. If you are doing business with third parties, I don't care. Like until you've had this happen to you, you're never going to fully appreciate it. People can sue you for just about anything. And in business, they will. Even if you have a worker and all of a sudden they claim that they were an employee and you discriminated against them or you wrongfully terminate them, it can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not higher. So what do we do? We use an entity. You pay the state. It's no different than if you watch the, the movies of the old mob and they say, hey, you know, do you want, do you want, do you want your storefront protected? Make sure your windows don't get broke. And if you didn't pay them, right, what do they do? The windows broke. But you pay them and nothing ever happens, right? Because now you have protection. The state offers that protection for you from a liability standpoint. You just pay the state and they say, hey, nobody can go beyond this box. You do a few things. You pay us. You make sure you meet some formalities, some basic stuff. And you get protection. It's called liability protection. That's number one. You got to make sure you do that. So I'm just going to hit that right off the gate. If you are somebody who's operating as a sole proprietorship in your name and you're selling goods and services online, or you're doing business with third parties, or you're a lender, or you're whatever, fill in the blank. The liability is virtually unlimited and can follow you around until your end of day. So make sure that you're putting a box around that liability by using at a minimum an LLC. It's called a limited liability company. So I'm going to contrast sole proprietorships, S corps and C corps, but keep in mind in the back of your head, you could be an LLC and be taxed as all three of those. Any of them is what I'm saying. 
So I could be an LLC disregarded and ignored tax to my personal account. I could be an LLC tax as an S corp. I could be an LLC tax as a C corp, or I could be an S corp, or I could be a C corp. It's that simple. If you have partners, then when I say sole proprietorship, you could just say partnership instead. It's, it's the same thing. So the number one, and I'm just going to put this up on a screen, put myself in the corner. So we need to be cognizant of liability. And all we're doing is if you have a business and you have a person here, yay, here's me. I just want to put a box around that. We also, because we do that, we also get some protection from stuff that could happen to you. Like if you're driving in a car and you get into a car accident, you want to make sure they can't just go in and take all your business assets too. During uh, um, any situation where you're finding yourself in a lawsuit, you want to make sure that that stuff doesn't handle or it doesn't happen. So uh, we want to make sure that there's a box around it. And that is, that's our friend, the LLC. It could be an ink you know, straight up corporation, but you want to make sure that you have something that creates a barrier around you. Now, we want to talk specifically about sole proprietor. I'll just make a little line here. S Corp and C Corp. And I'm just going to do kind of like pros and cons. Oops. We'll make our cons into red. All right. So I'll write these out. So let's go over why somebody might be a sole proprietorship. Number one, you say, hey, Toby, if it's so bad, why does anybody do it? And the pro is because it's easy. It's the default. If I do nothing else, I could just file a Schedule C on my 1040 and I'm magically a sole proprietorship. Now, this is where the tax comes in. And in the tax world, there's an adage, which is if you are an individual, I'll just put an individual up here, you earn, you're taxed, and then you spend. When you're a business, you earn, you spend, and then you're taxed. Maybe I'll do tax. There we go. So it's that little difference is the spending moves up. That's all. And it becomes something called a deduction. So going back to our friend, the sole proprietorship, and I'm sorry if that's behind my head here, I'll do it like this. There we go. So you guys can see it. Um, in the sole proprietorship, we have a Schedule C and we're going to take deductions. And so we are going to spend and we are going to get business expenses, which is this little guy right up here. We're going to spend and we're going to lower our taxable income. So your, your taxes will drop if you're doing that sole proprietorship and you're doing it right. The cons of a sole proprietorship in the meantime is unlimited liability if you don't set up an LLC. And that's a pretty big one. Huge. It's too easy to create a big, massive liability problem for yourself. And I've actually seen it. I had a client, they uh, tapped somebody, they were in their, their business van, you know, like they had their, their uh, contracting business on the side of the van and they tapped somebody in a, in a bank line. And uh, almost two years later, they get sued, served with this lawsuit, like, and this is how, literally what she said. She says, hey, I tapped somebody. I got out. I looked. I asked, her, hey, everything okay? Oh, there's no mark. There's nothing on the bumper. And the guy was like, no big deal. Don't worry. And her kid was in the back seat. And she's like, oh, okay, I just, I, I, I'm sorry. I just rolled into you. It was, it was, they were like in the line at a bank. So it wasn't like they were moving very fast. Well, of course, two years later, it's a catastrophic injury that did massive amounts of damage to the child. And they're suing for seven figures. And who do they sue? They saw the name on the side of the van. So what do they do? They thought that there was bigger policies or whatever. I mean, lawyers are notorious. They go after the deep pockets. So they think, oh, business. 
maybe they have better liability policy. Maybe there's something we can get there. So they went after, bought, bought herself a lawsuit. So you want to make sure that you're limiting that liability so that at worst case scenario, it's stuck inside that box, inside that business. So that's one of the cons. The other con is an increase in audit rates. Because it's easy, it's really easy to defraud the government. So let me give you some stats here. Let's say you're a business making $100,000 a year and you're a sole proprietorship. According to the last available data in publication 55, and it's usually table 17B, although they just discontinued it for this year, but the last year we had, your audit rate was 1.6%. Your audit rate as an individual otherwise is about 0.1%. Your audit rate as an S-Corp is 0.2% most years, sometimes goes down to 0.1. It's right there. In other words, your audit rate is 1,600% higher than a typical person and 800% higher than our friend, the S-Corp, which is you know one of your options here. So your audit rate skyrocketed, but that's not even the most important number. The most important number is that the lose... 94 to 95 percent of the time if you're a sole proprietorship because they're easy the 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 formality requirement for any business is identical whether you're an s-corp c-corp sole proprietorship partnership doesn't matter you have to track your numbers sole proprietors are notorious for not doing that because it's so easy to operate as a sole proprietorship that you just don't realize that every business call has to be tracked Every business mile has to be tracked. You now have entered the world of you have to document that something was a business expense or it didn't happen. I'm going to push this up so I can see it a little bit better. Sorry if it makes some of that stuff go away. So this is where people get into a lot of trouble and they lose almost all the time. And the IRS knows this. So where are they going to go? They're going to go where they get paid the most. So they lose like crazy. Last one, because you're a sole proprietor, you get to pay your federal taxes, your state, plus you pay both sides of something called old age disability survivors insurance plus Medicare, 15.3%, which is also called the self-employment tax. No bueno. On every net dollar, every dollar that you end up netting, you make, you're going to pay not only your federal income tax, not only whatever your state is, but you're also going to pay both sides of Social Security. And they call it a self-employment tax. The reason they call it a self-employment tax is because every other business, the business pays half and, and you pay half. And in some cases, the it doesn't even exist. Like on profits out of an S-Corp, or a C-Corp, there's no, there's no Social Security. So it's just for, it's just for you as a, self as a sole proprietorship. So those are some pretty major cons. Now let's go to our friend, the S-Corp. And the S-Corp, I'll just say that as a pro, is it eliminates... I'm just going to say 60% plus of self-employment taxes. And that's because you take a reasonable salary. It's usually about a third that you take as a reasonable salary and everything else that you take. So you take a small salary out of your business because you're considered an employee of an S-Corp. And any of the profit that comes down to you is not subject to self-employment tax, which is really, really beneficial. It avoids 15.3%. The number, when you look at the, because part of it's deductible, is 14.1%. But just think, uh, hey, I made 100000 bucks, paid myself 40, and I'm not even talking about using a 401k and deferring a big chunk of that and all that fun stuff, which you can do. But let's just say you paid yourself 40 and had $60,000 of profit. Well, 14% of $60,000, I'm trying to do the math in my head, is somewhere around 9000 bucks that you get to keep, put it in your pocket. Um, that's the difference between that structure 
And by the way, if you're an LLC, you could become an S corp with one page of what one document. It's called a 2553. You only have to do a bunch of other stuff. Um, also, the lower audit rate, it's really low. It's a flat, like 0.2%. Some years it's 0.1%. S-Corps generally don't get audited, but we know why they get audited when they do. And it's because they took distributions without taking a salary. So you have a salary requirement that's, and you know, that would actually be a, I'll put that as a con. I'll just say salary requirement. But you have a salary requirement and then the rest of it, whether you take it or not, it's going to be taxed on your return. It flows on your return. So the net profit, whether you leave it in the business or take it out, it's being taxed to you. And therefore, you could take money out of the S-Corp really easy. In the S-Corp and the C-Corp, this is what's really important, is they're both considered an employer and you're the employee. You can't do that with a sole proprietorship or a partnership in which you're a partner. And as a result, you get to do something called an accountable plan. And the reason that's important is because now your benefits, like remember I said the cell phone, you have to track business and personal. You don't have to do that with an escort. Did it benefit the business? Great, I can write off 100%. So I'm just going to call it tax-free French benefits plus and, and, uh, and I'm just going to put plus, you know, you can get all sorts of other benefits out of it. It can reimburse mileage. It can reimburse the administrative use of your home. You can use something called 280A and reduce your taxes even further. You cannot do that with the sole proprietorship. You can do that with the S-Corp. You can also do that with the C-Corp, which I'll, I'll, I'll go over in a second. But those are some pretty good size benefits. And because it's an entity, you get limited liability so we've isolated our li our liability this is why serious planners almost never use a sole proprietorship they almost always use an s corp and most accountants are going to use an s corp because this is such a huge one this eliminates the self-employment tax they tend to gravitate towards the so the s corp i like c corps too for reasons you'll see in a second but but that's why they gravitate now what are the downsides is uh, well, you have to file a separate tax return. It's called 1120S. It's the same information that's on your Schedule C. Like it's almost identical, but it's a separate tax return. You know, and some tax preparers charge differently. You know, they might say, hey, I'm going to charge you an extra such and such to do that return. It's just, you know, it's the juice worth the squeeze. You look at it and say, how much did I save? And oh, this, you know, so I have an extra 500, 1000 bucks, whatever it is to do that return. I would have had to do the same thing on my personal return as a Schedule C, but let's just assume, hey, it's going to cost you a few hundred bucks more, up to a thousand, two thousand, whatever. If you have a crazy accountant just charging the hell out of you, it's still better if you got that six thousand dollar extra tax deduction, right? Like or tax savings, I should say, deduction. And then plus, you're going to get the administrative office in your home, which allows you to write off about twenty percent of the expenses of your house, depending on how much space you're using. If you're using a full room and like it's a three bedroom house, it's probably gonna be about 20% of all your expenses in that house you can reimburse because the business is using it. And by the way, when it reimburses you these things, it does, you don't have to report it. It's non-taxable, it's, it's an accountable plan, it's an employee benefit. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other negatives there. I mean, cause that's the whole thing is sometimes they say the formalities, but, uh, And I guess I should say this, that if you're doing an S corp versus a sole proprietorship without an entity, you're going to have some state filing fees. You know, so depending on your state, you may have a, you know, a little bit of money that you paid to keep that. Remember when I said you're protecting the storefront, you're paying, you're paying someone to protect it. You're paying the state some protection. So we'll just be fair. There, there might be some state filing fees there, you know, depending on your state, it could be 50 bucks. If, could be more if you're in California, for example, if it's an LLC, S Corp, C Corp, whatever, it's maybe 800 bucks is the minimum. But it always varies depending on your jurisdiction. Some are really low, some are a little bit higher, but you're going to pay that. You're going to pay that regardless, I think, because I've never set up a business that does business with third parties without putting a box around it. You're going to incur that. But I'm going to allocate that to the S Corp just so I have some more cons on there and it's not all pro. 
Um, pro with a C Corp. Let's talk about this. No salary requirement. In other words, in an S Corp, when you make money, technically you only have to take a salary if you're distributing the money to yourself. So if you have net profit that's not distributed, you don't technically have an, a salary requirement. But in a C Corp, there's just no salary requirement. You could get compensated with just French benefits. And the accountants that are losing their mind at me right now, I'm, I'm sorry, man, there's, there's nothing there that, that, that requires the salary. There's plenty of folks that work for a dollar or work for nothing or work for the French benefits, especially when you move into the nonprofit side, which is the same rules. It's, yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to take it. You, you could work for the French benefits and be happy with it. So there's no salary requirement. So the C Corp could make a million bucks. It pays a flat. 21% tax. So you could be making a, you, know, you, you and your personal realm might have high income and then you have a business. You may be better off running that business as a C Corp and keeping it at flat tax because it's cutting your tax in half. I mean, in many cases, that's exactly what it's doing. It's and even worse, depending on what state you're in. You might be better off keeping it out of your state, letting the business run outside your state and just letting it accumulate money uh, over time. And if, especially if you're growing business, you may want to do that. Um, the other pro obviously is limited liability, just like its brother, the S Corp. And you get lots of tax free French benefits. There's a extra benefit of a C Corp which is the medical, dental, vision expenses are 100% uh, reimbursable and tax-free to the recipient. So if you have, uh, let's say it's a small mom and pop because you, you can't discriminate against employees in, in this scenario, but let's say that it's a small, closely held business you have a spouse that works for an employer and they have decent insurance, but it's high deductible and high co-pays and it doesn't cover everything. You could have a C-Corp on the side that's literally reimbursing you every dollar that you come out of pocket. and It's not taxable to you and it's deductible to the company. So you remember the company, this guy up here, that spending could be medical. Here, I'll make it so you can actually see it. Medical and it's in it. So your tax goes way down. So your tax could be nothing, especially if you have high medical expenses. So what are the cons of the uh, our friend, the C-Corp? Well, you have a separate tax return called an 1120. Uh, most accountants will tell you there's a double tax because the company makes profit and it's taxed at 21%. In order for that to come out to you, you have to pay a dividend but dividends are taxed at 0, 15 or 20%. They're taxed as long-term capital gain. So if you're, depending on what your tax bracket is, you could be letting it sit in there and then it, you might have a, a dividend someday. I could count on one hand how many companies I've seen pay dividends, um, but uh, uh, closely held, they're usually trying to expense it and get it down to zero, or if they're accumulating money, they're not gonna pay it out as a dividend, they're gonna continue to grow the company. And there's other ways to get money out of a C-Corp or use it for benefit. You're growing that. Uh, but let's just say, hey, I want the money. I'm going to pay it out as a dividend. Then it's not like you get taxed at your ordinary rate. You get taxed at this. In some cases, it's zero. It's paying you a dividend in a year that you don't have a bunch of other money. Maybe it's a down year or something like that. Married filing jointly, you're making 60 grand or something like that. It could pay you an extra 20 some thousand dollars, $28,000 at zero. So it could give you some of that profit in, in that particular situation. Uh, what else is the bad side? I guess you do have an elevated audit risk. If you have more than $250,000 of asset on your, uh, or of net, value on your balance sheet. So if you start having a balance sheet that's got millions of dollars, the audit rate doesn't go, whew, it's not like a sole proprietorship, but it, go, it starts going up. You get over $10 million and you have a high audit risk. Uh, big companies get audited more often than just about anybody else. 
And that's because they're a big company. And if you're a big company, you're making $10 million a year, that's 10 million in your balance sheet. So, so that's probably a, you know, 50, $60 million company there. You probably have a CFO and you have your own accounting and you, you, you already know what's going to happen. It's going to happen once in a while. Like every 20 years, you probably should be prepared to have an audit as opposed to an S corp, which is every 500 years. Right. But you look at those things and you weigh them. If, if, if by the way, if you have a small C corp, it's, fractional it's really really small audit rate that's it's, it's in the toilet it's there's just not much there it's like the escort the, the the irs again remember these little guys up here you earn tax spend it's really easy to hit this person right here this this guy is a good target this one not such a good target because all they got to do is oh i spent it over here oh you can't write that off well I spent a bunch of money over here that I can and it offsets, you know, so they, they tend, the IRS is, is interested in getting money and, and benefiting from that money. So it's like, they're probably not going to go after the business. If the business can still write it off, you know, you start auditing them and they come back and they go, Oh, we could have written this off too. We forgot to You call that sandbag. And that does happen where, you, you didn't realize how much stuff you actually could have written off and you wrote off only part of it. And then the IRS comes along and you end up, they end up writing you a check that does happen. And it happens actually quite often. I've run across so many of those folks and we experience it once in a while. We don't have too many audits. We do about 10,000 returns here. We had, I think a dozen last year. It's a really small amount, but it's always fun when they do. And you, it makes you really look at everything and you're like, you could have written that off. You could have written that off. You could have written that off. Hey, you could write that. And it ends up being a net benefit to the client because it forced them to take a closer look at their accounting. So anyway, that's just something to, to consider. So end of the day, of those three, of those three, really, um, sole proprietorship comes in, in third. It's just not really very good. Uh, I would say that the C Corp, just by a slight margin, comes in second because most people that are running a business and need to take a salary, they need to live off of it the ease and use of getting money out of an S-Corps can be that little extra benefit. It always depends. We love C-Corps here in my firm. I love, I love working when, especially have multiple structures. Hey, I have a real estate investor that also has a business. I'm going to use the C-Corp most of the time, but if I just have, Hey, I'm setting up a new business and I, I rely on it to take money out and I, and that's how I make my living. Most folks, and I'm going to say that most accountants are probably going to agree with me too. You usually look at that S corp because of the avoidance of the self-employment tax and because you don't have a double tax on the profit that we're looking at that route. If, if, the, if you need that money to live off of and you need it consistently, then that's probably the route you're going to go. Hope you learned something. If you know anybody that's in business and could benefit from this information, please do share it. And then also keep in mind that every month we teach a tax and asset protection course. We specifically gear them towards real estate investors, but the principles go across all boundaries. Feel free to join us for that. It's absolutely free. Generally, we're, spe we're teaching it a couple times a month, and we, we really do encourage you to do it live. And so we give huge incentives and, uh, and some ridiculous offers to those that are actually live on. We, nobody else gets access to it, even if, even if there's no recording. But even if there was a recording, we don't play games like that. No, if you spend some time educating yourself, then there's going to be benefits for you. Hope to see you in one of those classes. Otherwise, share this with people that you think would benefit from it. And leave me comments. I love seeing what you guys have to write. So thanks again.